welcome to the third week lecture and this will be about descriptive statistics for univariate data. My name is Dr. Richard Minka and I will be taking you through this um, part of the course. All right. Now, so in this lecture, we're going to talk about descriptive statistics, the definition of descriptive statistics, why do we use the treaty statistics? Then we look at measures of location, which deals with central part and then non-central part of divisions of data. And we will talk about measures of variability and then measures of symmetry and then distribution. All right. Now, so for definitions, we look at statistics. And statistics is the science pertaining to the collection organization, analysis, then interpretation, or let's say explanation, and presentation of data. Now, what do we mean by this? Well, statistics is about data. So the first thing you do when you have a problem that you want to use statistics to solve, let's say, let's take an example where we want to predict the opinion, uh, sorry, the the who will win the next presidential election okay now so in such a polling you are interested in opinions of eligible voters in other ways voters that are registered or on let's say in ghana the electoral commission's um, voters register now so the first thing we'll do is that if we are able to identify them we are going to collect data so that the art of collecting the data it's the collection part, which is the beginning of it. Then when we get data, it's going to be our vote for this party, maybe MPP, NDC, our vote for CPP, PNC, GUM, what have you. Okay. Now, so when you get all these things, it will be in raw form. Okay. So we can organize the data. In the organization, it could be that we do a frequency table, right? In we tally, and then we know the number of people who said they will vote for NDC, number of people, MPP, number of people who vote for GIM, number of people who vote for CPP, and so forth. Okay. Now, then we have to analyze it. So maybe we take percentages, and we're able to tell that this, uh, um, this um, particular political party will gain maybe 40% of the data, the next one maybe 51%, and so forth. Okay. Now, then there's an interpretation part. So whatever value we compute, we should be able to interpret it such that any layman will understand whatever we are doing, right? So that's the interpretation part. And then the presentation of data. So after that, we present our results. Okay, sometimes these results may be in, a, in the form of a table, in the form of a statistic that is um, 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 like we compute a value for let's say an average or a proportion in this case in our example you look at the proportion of what uh, people who vote for this particular party so if the the, the proportion is more than 50 percent or 0.5 then you know that this political party is likely to win the next election and, and so forth so that's what we mean by statistics. Then the descriptive part of statistics mainly have what? Descriptives and the inferential part, right? So the descriptive statistics is where we describe the data. Okay, so to describe it, you summarize it in a form that you can, you know, uh, 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 put it out in a meaningful way. So for example, you draw a bar chart you draw a, a, a bar chart to represent, let's say, the, um, the number of people who vote for a particular party or the percentages and so forth. Okay. So the purpose of descriptive statistics is that it makes data meaningful. So it makes it sensible and meaningful so that you can, you know, give it, I mean, to an audience, you know, other than that, the raw data doesn't look um, presentable it's messy and so forth. So we resort to discrete statistics. The inferential aspect is where 
you use, let's say, you take a sample, and then you get something from the um, 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 a statistic on the sample, and then you use this to generalize as what is happening in the population. We'll do some of these things in your level 200 and 300, where we will talk about hypothesis testing and so forth. Okay. So we rake up data. Data can be categorical, it can be what? quantitative. Now, for categorical data, what are some of the graphical uh, or the, the descriptive statistics or uh, what we can use to describe the data? Well, we can use tabular methods or graphical methods. For graphical methods, you have bar chart, pie chart, there are other charts, but it's okay at this level to know these two. And then for tabular part, we can get frequency distribution, relative frequency percent, and sometimes cross tabulation. Okay. Now, for quantitative methods, you can use what? Tabular methods, the same as uh, frequency distributions, um, relative frequency, cumulative frequencies, uh, cross tabulations. And for graphical methods, you can use dot plots, histogram, old drive, um, stem and leaf scatter plot, box plot, and, and, and what have you. Okay. Now, so. From this, we now talk about measures of location. Now, so measures of location, um, we have central locations and then other locations. Okay. When we talk about central locations, we mean, um, we mean to talk about, say, a mean, a mode, and a median, right? These things measure the central part of any particular data set. Then the others, quartiles, decimals, and percentiles, they can measure central as well as non-central location. So, for example, we will get to know that um, these quartiles, decimals, and percentiles, they are related, and the middle part of each of them is what the median. And the median is what is a measure of central location. Okay. So, we take a look at each of these and the first thing we look at is the mean. Now, when we talk about mean, usually that what comes to mind is what? The arithmetic mean. But there are other forms of mean, in fact, several of them. And here we are taking only three. So the first one is arithmetic mean, which is what we are used to. Then we can talk about geometric mean and then harmonic mean. Now, so what is the arithmetic mean? Simply, it is the average so in other ways, if I have any sample, I add all the values, I divide by the total number. If it is a population, I'll do the same thing by adding all the, the, the observations in the, in, the, in the population, then I divide by the total number of observations. Okay. Now for a population, the, um, and I must say that in statistics, because we talk about population and samples, Usually, all the parameters, you know, concerning a population are represented using the Greek letters. In samples, we use what? Um, the normal letters like um, X, Y, and, 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 and so forth. Okay. The P, for example, the proportion will use P or P hat. Okay. So forth. Now, so this is how we compute the arithmetic mean for the population, as I have illustrated, and the sample mean. It's like that. Okay, so here n and small letter n are the population and the sample sizes. Now, for the mean, in some instances, you will not be given a raw data where you know the raw life scores. Other times, too, you may be lucky that you have um, the data, and for example, a particular data is repeated maybe 10 times or 20 times or 30 times. There is no need to be writing, let's say, if it is 15 and 15 occurs 20 times, you take 15 plus, 15 plus, 15 plus, and so forth 20 times. So you don't do that. What you do is that you can actually record the frequency of 15, and if 15 is 20, then you see, you can multiply the frequency by all oh, 15 to get the total, um, the total, 
okay so in this case we say that x1 x2 up to xn are some free occurs with frequencies f1 f2 fn f1 any of these fi's may be one or more okay then the mean is computed as this we we multiply the frequencies by the respective um, values and then we divide by the total which is sum of all the frequencies but sometimes you may be in, you may be given only groups and in, in, if you have groups and the group frequency it is difficult to know whether a particular number within the group occurs f1 times and so forth so all we know is that this interval they are f1 values that occurs there but you don't know exactly what it is so for example 10 to 12 we know that there are four values but we don't know whether all the four were 10 or all the four were 12 or two were 10 one was 11 and the other 12 okay but so we should be able to compute the mean to compute the mean we simply find the class mark or the class boundary then we use that as uh, the, 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 the the class midpoint we multiply that by the frequency and then we sum and divide by the total the frequency and that gives us this so in this case this is the mean okay now one thing about the mean is that the mean may not necessarily be like an observation so for example if in this example this um the the table gives out frequency distribution of all the number of orders received you may ask yourself number of orders won't be let's say 16.64 it will be whole numbers but our mean is not a whole number so in this case to make a meaning out of it you may have to round it is that okay to let's say 17 so you know the on average um the, the or the average um orders received per day is approximately what 17 orders orders now the next one is a harmonic mean so this mean is usually or is com um, computed by dividing the sample side by what the reciprocals the sum of the reciprocals of each values in a data set okay and it is important mean and we use it usually for rates or ratios so there are some series that comes in the form of ratios for example on the um uh, the the price earnings ratios and so forth on on the financial market okay or let's say the rate of uh, change of something or the rate of increase of, of something so if you have the, such a data then an appropriate mean to use is a harmonic mean so as i was saying some examples here so as the the harmonic mean is computed as a simply the population divided population side by all the sum of the reciprocals of each value okay so we can find the harmonic mean of these and if you look at it how many do we have we have um, five observations so five divided by one over ten plus one over thirteen plus one over eighty and so forth after that so we compute it as this and you get 16.9 so that's simply the harmonic mean the next one is a geometric mean. The geometric mean is derived as just the nth root, okay, of the of, of the product of the observations. So mathematically, this is how we find out the um, geometric mean. So you have the product, and then you take the nth root of it. So an example is this: we have these observations. What is the um, we can easily find the geometric mean and the geometric mean will just be all five times six times nine times ten times fifteen and then we find all the fifth root of it now there is a relationship between the arithmetic mean the geometric mean and what the harmonic mean now if x and y are two values then the arithmetic mean is just a sum divided by two. The geometric mean will also be the square root. The harmonic mean we can do, 
derive it in this form that it is because it's two over what one over x plus one over y we can make it this way or we can express it in this form so if we look at this then we know that um if you multiply the arithmetic mean by the harmonic mean you get what the geometric mean squared because the geometric mean was a root of what x y so x y means geometric squared. so now from this we can see that the arithmetic mean it places high weight on large values while geometric mean places lower weight to smaller data points or value now from this you should be able to find what the arithmetic mean uh, you've been given the arithmetic mean and the geometric mean you should be able to find what the harmonic mean quite easily due to this relationship between them okay now the median now so another measure of central tendency is the median now the median of a data set is just the number that divides the data into two equal parts right so it is the middlemost number but important issue it is the middlemost number in an ordered array that order may be decreasing or increasing so i can sort the data from the minimum to the maximum or i can sort it from what maximum to minimum whichever way the median is the middlemost number we divide we denote it at s tilde and for if we have in a sample of size n then the position of the median is half n plus one i said and underline this is the position of the median not the median because the median will be an actual value of the um, variable under consideration now so let's look at an example if i have a sample of size 11 then the position of my median will be 11 plus 1 12 divided by 2 6 so it will be the number in the c's position alternatively if my sample size is 10 then the position of my median will be 5.8 position or 5.5 for five and a half position now what this means is that if i have and to be odd then my median is always one of the values in the data set however if my sample has an even um, number the sample size has even is, is, is even then um, my median will fall into um not one of them but a position in between the two middlemost numbers so in that case what do you do you will add those two numbers and then you divide by odd two and the numbers here i mean the values of the sample the ordered values of the of, the, of your sample okay so let's look at an example we have this and look at it this one the sample size is what six six is an even number so what do you think our position of the median will not fall on a value but in between two values so let's see the first thing we do is to sort we sort from two four five eight nine twelve so in ascending order sample size n is six position of the median is 3.5 so what is the number in the 3.5 position well it is between what five and eight so i add five to eight divide by two and six point five so the median is what 6.5 and this position is what 3.5 now the mode so the mode is the data that appears most frequently right okay so if we have a data set we are likely to have one mode more than one mode or no mode and i'll explain if we have a data set in which all of them appear the same number of times, you say there's no mode. So I can list the numbers 1, 2, 3, up to 10. And I ask you, what is the mode? There's actually no mode because none of the numbers appears more than once. But I can also have 
a data setting where there are two modes. And two modes are referred to as bimodal. So in the same example, if I add 1 and 9 to my sample 1, 2, 3, up to 10, I'll get two modes, and the modes are 1 and 9, because they appear twice. And if we have two or more modes, we say multimodal. Now we talk about quartiles, measures of location. Okay. Before I talk about this, I want to stress on some um, of the implications of these central um, measures. You see, each of them has its advantages and they really help us in decision making. So I'm going to talk about some examples and then we see how this mode, median, and mean will help us in making a decision. One, I want to operate a shop and this shop is going to sell dresses for female students on University of Ghana campus. Now, if you ask the ladies in the class, they will tell you that their dresses are marked in what? Even numbers. So maybe size 6, if you are so small, size 8, size 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, maybe 24, too large. But somebody may wear such size. Now, the question is, if I'm able to interview people on campus to know their sizes, the address sizes, in this case females, what, of, what measure of central tendency will help me to be able to, you know, um, place orders to fill the shop? Now, if I'm going to use the mean, I may compute the mean, and the mean may be what? 11. Right? Because I'm adding numbers, I'm dividing by the total number, so it is possible that I'll get a mean of 11, or a mean of 13, or a mean of 14, and so forth. But remember, there is no size 13 for the ladies. So if I use the mean in making a decision, then you're going to tell whoever you are advising that go get size 13 maybe more because that is what on average people wear. But of course, you will place that order, let's say, in Singapore, Hong Kong, or China, and you won't get any size 13 on any website. So you get it. So although the mean is helpful, in this case, it is meaningless to use the mean. One may ask, what about the mode? Or le let me take the median. Well, we can use the median. However, remember the median two may fall in between two numbers, right? Now, if the median is at the 15.5 position and the 15th observation is 14. And sorry, the 15th observation is less than 12. And the 16th observation is 14. Then I'll compute my median, and my median will be 13. But there's also no size 13. Right? So the mean, median, the, the mean and median may not be helpful in this example. Rather, the mode will help us. Because the mode will record the, the size that is um, um, most frequent in this uh, population, maybe size 12. So most people you interviewed were size 12. If you are advising the shop owner, you will say, okay, you must what, get more of size 12. And the others, you tone down upon it. In other words, you buy a small number of um, 
the other sizes because you are sure that most people that will come to the shop will wear a size 12. So that's one example. Okay. Now, remember that the mean, the mean is affected by odds, large or small values, right? So if I have to, let's say, operate a clinic and the clinic is meant for children, okay, let's say children in a school, and I want to buy, um, let's say, um, paracetamol, of course I can buy paracetamol syrup or I can buy all the tablet. Now, if a child of, let's say, six years or five years is sick and you have to give a paracetamol tablet, you will be, it's difficult. Okay, they may not be able to swallow. If you dissolve it because it is bitter, they won't take it. But the syrup is quite sweet, so every child will like paracetamol syrup. And the question is, how can you use, let's say, the ages of the children as well as the supporting staff teachers to be able to make a decision? Then, if you want to make a decision with the mean concerning the age, if there are, let's say, four, um, two teachers and two supporting staff in this nursery school, you may end up, because of their age, it may push their average age to, let's say, 16. So if you are making a decision on just the mean, what you are going to say is that, you know, let me buy tablets. But majority of your class may be children who are unable to, you know, um, um, swallow the tablet. So you end up getting so many tablets and it is of no use. Okay, so this... Measures of central tendencies are important in helping us to make everyday decisions that we make in life. Okay, so our mothers who have not even gone to school and done statistics and so forth, they use this in their everyday businesses and lives. Okay, so that's just about a few, and I'm, I, I hope in your various classes there will be some more examples where you have to choose between one of these um, measures of central tendencies. So now I move on to quartiles. Okay. Now, so I'll just digress a bit. So there's an Excel function called quartile, which is used in the, uh, computing quartiles. And I'll talk about, I'll explain what quartiles is. But before then, the measures of location we have talked about, we can also use Excel to compute them. And it is important that you, you get yourself abreast with some of these um, um, functions in Excel. Okay. So you can add some add-ins like data, analysis plus, P stars, and so forth to help you in doing some of these statistics that we'll be doing this semester and beyond. And it is important you do so because if you, for example, go for internship and they give you a data set, such data set will be large in number. You can't sit with a calculator to be computing the mean for a data set that is made up of, let's say, 10,000 observations. But you can quickly load into Excel and be able to compute some of these measures quite easily. So that's an advice for you. Now, so what are quartiles? So quartiles are measures of location, but they help us in dividing the data set into four equal parts. Okay, so each part contains 25% of the observations. Now, for the first quarter, just like we find median, for quartiles, we must also order the data set. Then we must find the position of the quarter. So the position of the first quarter is 1 over 4, 1 plus n, or n plus 1, which is just like when we were computing a median. Remember, median, we divided by 2, 1 over 2. 
because you divide the data into all two parts. Now, the second quartal is what? 2 over 4. In other words, 1 over 2. So this is just like the median, as I said earlier. And the third quartal, the position of the third quartal is 3 over 4 times what? N plus 1. Okay. So the quartals are like this. If we order the data, the first quarter is like the second quarter, third quarter. So each side contains for 25% of the data. Now, so an example, we have a set of values and we want to find what? The, the third quarter. The answer is actually six. But how do you get it? Well, two ways. We can find the median. Because the median will divide the data into two parts. We can find the third quarter as the median of the top values greater than what the median or we can use the formula as we saw over here to compute the position and then order the data and then we find the value in that position so whichever way you want to look at it you should be able to find it similarly for the first quarter you can find it as well the median of what the numbers below the median or you can use the formula to find the first quarter. Second quarter, we've already talked about it as a mean, so that should be it. Now, this house. This house are similar to quarters. However, in this case, they are divided into 10 equal parts. Each of these contains what? It's an equal number of what? Um, um, observations. Okay. Now, we can also link decimals to percentiles because percentiles also divide our data into what? 100 parts. So the first decimal is the 10th percentile. Second decimal is the 20th percentile. Third decimal, 30th percent, and so forth. Now, percentile. So, as I said, the percentile will divide the data set into 100 equal parts. And then if we take, let's say, a P percent, let's say 95% percent percentile, the 95 percentile will then divide the data such that 95% percent of the observations will be below P. And then what? Um, 100 minus P percent will be what? Above that particular value. So if we want to calculate a percentile, it's the same as the median approach. You arrange the data. You find the position of the, that percentile. If the percentile um, is, um, the, the sample size is odd, um, the, the, if it is, sorry, if it's not an integer, you round it up to the nearest integer. However, you can actually find it even if it is a point two or point three or point four whatever it is you can actually study the distance between the two values okay the two adjacent values and then you find that point three of that distance and that will give you exactly the 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 actual percentile you are after okay so an example here is about a company that will preach a mutual fund, and this mutual fund is targeted um, um, at the informal sectors. We have some um, uh, rates in terms of percentage, and you have what? We are asked to determine the fee data. Remember, the fee data is a median, so we can find it quite easily. All right. So you can go through this example with your measures of central tendencies as well, mean, median, mode, and that means you find all the three means, and then you can comment on your results, okay? But for the DSA, it's the same thing, as I said, you arrange, you find the fit DSA like that, or the 50th percentile, and that the position is six, and the six, the sixth position is what, three percent. Remember, I added what the unit of measurement percent. So the feed data is the fifth percent and it's go to the median. Okay. So that's about measures of location. And I'll move on to measures of variability. 
So for when we talk about measures of viability, we mean, we, we mean that we will measure dispersion or spread of the data set. Okay. And there are, we are going to talk about four frequently used measures. They are the range, the interquartile range, the variance, and the standard deviation. Now, the simplest of these measures of variation is the range. And the range is simply the largest value minus the smallest value. Now, one disadvantage of this measure of variation range is that it is easily influenced by all um, the largest or the very small values. So, for example, if I have a village where all of them are peasant farmers who cultivates around the same acreage of um, um, a particular, let's say, crop, you see their income will be around the same value. Okay, it will not be so much this way. However, if one indigent is, let's say, a big time contractor, road contractor, what have you, and you happen to go and take a sample from this village and you select that person, the variability of between their incomes will be so high if you use the range. Meanwhile, almost all of them receive the same amount except that particular person. So that's what we, I, 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 I'm talking about. Okay. Now, so in order to um, reduce some of this um, dependency, there's what we call interquartile range. The interquartile range. It's also a measure of variability, but in this case, it is just a difference between the third quarter and the, and the first quarter. Okay, so in that case, if they are, you know, very large values or very small value, it, it influences on the interquartile range. It's minimal. Okay, so the interquartile range look at the middle most 50% of the data. So you cut off those large or very small values and then you focus at the center okay next is variance now the variance is also a measure of variability and the variance is just what the average of the squared deviations now for deviations from the mean it can be either the sample or the population so we can have sample variance and the odd population variance. So the population variance is computed as odd, the average of the square deviation from the population mean. And that of sample is the average of what? The each individual observation from what the sample mean. But here we divide by n minus one instead of n. A simple explanation to this is that we've used one of our degrees of freedom from the same sample in computing the mean. So you lose one and so forth. But more important, this um, variance is said to be an unbiased variance. Okay. Now, so this variance, we can also find it using this formula if we expand it. Okay. Now, from variance, we get the standard deviation, which is also another measure of variation. The standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance. So we can have population and as well as sample standard deviations. Mind you, because the standard deviation is square root of the variance, they, are, they have standard deviation as the same unit as the raw data, whereas variance unit is what? Squared. The unit of the, of the um, raw data squared. Now, there's, when we want to co uh, compare variability between two variables that are of different units, it becomes difficult. Let me put it this way. Assuming I measure your age, sorry, I measure your weight, and then I also get data on your age. So for variable age, I can look at the variability within age using standard deviation or what? The variance. Similarly, if I take weight, I can also do the same thing. 
However, if I get the standard deviation of A to be, let's say, 2 years, and the standard deviation of weight to be, let's say, 10 kilograms, would you say that weight is more variable than age? Well, you can't say that because you don't know what the variable, uh, sorry. You, 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 the, the units are what? Different, that's what I mean. Okay, you can't compare them because the units are what? Different. Okay. So what do you do? We resort to a measure called coefficient of variation. So the coefficient of variation measures the standard deviation relative to its mean. So it is defined as well, the standard deviation divided by the, by the mean, and it is usually expressed in terms of percentage. So you, you multiply it by what? 100%. So we can have the population mean and what? Sorry, the population coefficient of variation and the sample of coefficient variation, all computed as that. Okay. So, Another way to look at this is that if we have a, a data set in which the, uh, the, the, the measurements are of the same unit, they may be of different magnitude. So, for example, if you want to compare the weight of ant to that of elephants, whereas one is in some few grams, the other is in what, thousands of kilograms. Okay. So, if you want to, let's say if you are providing some consultation for somebody at the animal biology department who is um, studying weights that involves an ant and an elephant and you want to see the variation between them, then it is good you express it as well, a coefficient of variation because it will compare the standard deviation relative to its mean and gives you a more objective um, measure that you can um, compare regardless of the unit because the unit is it's unitless because s is in the same unit mean is in the same unit so unit um, less a kilogram divided by a kilogram or, or the normal unit okay okay so i've talked about this and there's an example where you have a list of values Representing number of days spent by some patients, and you have to compute what you have done, and then you interpret, or you comment on your results. Okay. Now, I move to the last part of this, which talks about um, co uh, measures of symmetry. Now, so here. We are interested in we are interested in measuring shapes, right, of distributions. Okay. So okay, so after now. We have talked about measures of location and spread, but what we are left with is what about shapes, right? Um, so when you remember your histogram, when you get a histogram, you should be able to tell whether the histogram, if I, let's say, put a ruler through the center, will the other, the left part, be a mirror image of the other? Or not? Some we say it's skewed, okay, it may be skewed or not, and so forth. So that's what we will be interested in, and how well, how well the tails compare to a, a symmetric or a normal distribution. So we we'll discuss relative location, skewness, and kurtosis in this session. So the relative location looks at the distance of an observation from the mean, okay? And skewness is also a measure of symmetry. So a distribution or a data set is symmetric, okay, if the left and the right of the center point are mirror images of each other. That's what I, I said. So if you divide them, the one on the left looks just the same as what 
the one on the left, but mirror image of each other, okay? Then the ketosis also measures whether the data are long, longer tilled or light tilled than or the normal distribution or the symmetric distribution, okay? So relative location. So as stated earlier on, the measure of relative location helps you determine how far a particular value is from the mean. Okay, so one of the measures we use in doing this is what we call a z-score, or we, in most books, they will say standardized value. Okay, and the standardized value is what you take is zeta, and zeta is just the sample observation minus the mean of the sample divided by the standard deviation of the sample. Now, you must know that this is also unitless, right? Because xi may be in kilograms, this is also in kilograms, this is also in kilograms. So that the, the difference is in kilograms, this is in kilograms. So the z-score is what? Unitless. So it's also good for what comparison, right? Just like I talked about in the coefficient of variation. Okay. So the z score sometimes is interpreted as what the number of standard deviations SI is from what the mean. Now, once we know this, we are going to talk about how we can detect outliers. So this z score can be used in detecting outliers together with some other things we are now going to talk about. So in statistics, unusually large or unusually small values are of interest to statisticians. So for example, if I am collecting ages of people or students in start 111, and I happen to um, um, get, let's say I ask somebody to collect data on ages, the person took the sample and then I realized that somebody is 250 years old. Okay, so uh, most of the students are between 17 and 20. Then all of a sudden I have 250. Of course, it will be very difficult to get somebody who is 250 and still living, let alone be at the university and attending a level 100 course. Do you get it? So that will prompt you that there, something may be wrong. So probably the person wanted to um, record 25 and then he ended up recording of 250. So such a value we refer to them as outliers. Those outliers are distinct from the bulk of the data. So if you look at this data set we've provided, 3 and 850 are different, significantly different or in magnitude to the rest of the data. So they may be considered as outliers. Now, there is a theorem by Chebyshev which enables us to make statements about the proportion of data values that must be within the specified number of standard deviations of the mean. So this, in this theorem, at least one minus what, one over z squared of the data values must be within z standard deviations of the mean. And here, z is any value greater than 1. Okay. Because, of course, if it is 1, it is 0. You don't want 0 here. Right? Now, so if we... If we... If we take z to be 2... If we take z to be 2, the we have 75% of the data values must lie between negative 2 and 2. Or 7, sorry, we are saying that if z is equal to 2, you see you get 1 over 1 minus 1 over 4, which is 0 0.75, right? So the interpretation is that 75% of the data values must be within two standard deviations of the mean. If you take 3, you get 1 over 9. Okay? 
If you subtract, you get what? 0 0.89, which means 89% of the data values must be within what? Three standard deviations. Similar for four, we get 94%. 94%. Now, for a data set that is bell-shaped or symmetric, and I just want to show you what a symmetric data is. So here, if we do a histogram, the histogram will follow something like this. So this is called a symmetric distribution. You see, if I draw a line at the line um, over here at the middle part, what is here is a mirror image of the other. If it's a, a, a histogram, you draw a line. It's the same side. The other side, the bars on the left side are, are almost the same as the one on the right hand side, right? And then we say the data is or symmetric or bell shaped. Okay. Now, so when a data is of that form. Then the empirical rule says that approximately 68% of the data set will fall within one standard deviation. For two standard deviations, you are looking at 95%. And almost all the data sets are within three standard deviations of the mean. Now, so for statisticians, we, we always must take um, we always must take precautions when we see our lies okay when we suspect our lies okay okay now so i have explained this outliers may be recorded incorrectly so you must always check if they are not um they are not recorded in error then you must find a way of dealing with it so for example if we have to use a measure of central tendency we will not resort to the mean because the mean will be affected by such an outlier you may resort to the mode or what the median okay. now the standard values or the z score can be used to identify outliers so the recommendation is that if you find a z-score and it is less than negative three or greater than positive three then you, you can suspect that or you treat that as an outline okay now what do you do with with that we say that you have to check to see whether the value is accurate and and, and so forth okay so you have this background problem and you must go through it so it's a set of 18 women and 18 men who went to a, a half marathon and then we have recorded the finishing times okay and this can be found in the new naples uh, daily news okay so here what do we want you to do you find the mean of men mean of their medians as well take it Provide a five number summary, i.e., maximum, minimum, first quarter, and so forth for both men. You are also required to construct a box plot, okay, and be able to um, check whether the, um, the finishing times of women and men are more, women is more variable than men, or, and so forth, vice versa. And then you explain. And crucially, you are able, you should be able to determine whether. The outliers in this data. Okay. Another problem, you also look at um, annual sales, and here we say provide a five number summary. Do the data contain outliers? So you can use the Chebyshev's, you can use the Z score in, in, in doing this, right? Okay. Now, so using the Chebyshev's, we have a results you've been given the average and the standard deviation right and we want you to use a chevy chest theorem to calculate percentages of individuals who sleep between this and that so we expect that you do all this in in um as exercise and then during your tutorials you go over some of these uh, exercises you find in this okay so now that we've we are done with um, uh, measures of relative location, and also we've talked about how to detect outliers. 
I want to now talk about skewness. So skewness measures the shape of a distribution. There are basically two types of skewness. We have the positive and negative. Now, a positive skewness means the long tail is towards the right. So we say skew to the right or positively skewed. So look here. In this diagram, the longer tail is towards the right. So we say it is positively skewed. Here, the longer tail is towards the left, right? So we say negatively skewed or skewed to the left. Okay, here, there is no skewness. So the skewness here is all zero. So when the skewness is zero, it means it is what? It is um, um, a symmetric distribution. Okay. Now, let's look at the relationship between the central measures of central tendencies in these um, <laughs> different types of distributions. Now, so if we take the middle part, when it, the data is symmetric, the distribution of the data is symmetric, then all the me three measures of central tendencies are equal. Mean is equal to the median is equal to the mode. Now, if it is positively skewed, what do we mean to say that it is positively skewed? Well, it means that there is some large value somewhere with some small, you know, um, a frequency. And remember that when you have a large observation, what does it do? It pulls the mean towards itself. So that's why the mean is greater than all the other measures of central tendencies. So crucial, the mean and median are greater than the mode. And the mean is also greater than the median. Now, if you take skew to the left, now, what this means is that there is some or small value somewhere which is pulling the mean towards itself. So the mean now becomes smaller than the median, and the mode is at the other side. So the median is always in between, them but the position of the mode will switch depending on what what the skewness is okay so given a data set by knowing the mean and the median you can easily determine whether the data is skewed or not okay so i have explained this and so i will skip them and come to when do we say skewness is too much so we have a simple rule of thumb it is rare that you for example get um or simulate an example where you have your skewness to be exactly equal to zero okay you may get it but it's rare now so for Skewness, if it is between negative 0.5 and, point and 5, it's actually usually fairly symmetrical. Okay, but if it is between um, negative 1 to negative 0 0.5 or 0.5 to 0 0.1, well, depending on the sign, we say negatively skewed or positively skewed. Okay, but they are moderate. And beyond um, the absolute value of 1, they are what? Highly skewed. Okay. Now, so let's take a typical example. You have a data concerning house prices from a real estate company in Ghana. So they say the least house or the least price of house in this estate is hundred thousand, and the maximum is one million. Now. The average is also 500,000. The question is, if we say this data is positively skewed, what do we mean? Remember how I explained it earlier. If it is positively skewed, then it means there is some large observation which is pulling the mean towards itself. Okay. Now, so for positively skewed, the explanation is that most of these houses are costless, right? 
In other words, those in the lower bracket, they are they occur more frequently than those that are expensive. So maybe you have one which is one million, but the rest of it are between what hundred to two hundred thousand. Okay, such a data set will be what positively skewed. In the case of negatively skewed, it means one, uh, let's say one or some few houses are relatively cheap, but majority of them are what expensive, and and, and 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 so forth. So that's how you 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 interpret this. Okay. Now the question is, how do we compute the skewness? Well, we can determine whether it is skewed here or not. Okay. Now, I must say that we are using just one procedure to compute the skewness, but there are several of these. So if you look into books and other things, you'll find several of them. Okay. So we are sticking to just this one. It doesn't mean that when you get a skewness um, from last somewhere, which is not similar to this, it's not valid. There are variants of these um, um, uh, ways of what, um, computing the skewness. So we compute the skewness of the data as M3 divided by M2 raised to the power of Hebrew. Now M3 is just the third moment, okay? And then M2 is what, the second moment or the variance, okay? Now, there's a variant of this which we are referring to as adjusted sample skewness. And this is implemented in many softwares, statistical packages, or, and that one you adjusted using this um, um, expression. So let's look at the problem. So we have some appliances and customers were asked to rate them, and these are the ratings. We want to comp compute the mean and the median, compute the first and the third quarter, compute the standard deviation. Um, you should try and compute the skewness, okay, and check your values with this. And then, if you know the skewness to be this, comment on the shape of the distribution. And what are the Z-score associated with high sense and sunny? Then do the data contain any allies? So you must do this work as well. Okay. So we are going to illustrate compute uh, how to compute the skewness without um, an, um, a group data. So this table consists of 100 male students. And this is a reference. And these are groups, okay? So we know that there are 60, uh, the class mark, so this is the class midpoint for, for this, okay? And this is the frequency, about five of them were in that group, 15, 42, and so forth. Okay. So we do a, a histogram and it looks like, if you look at this histogram, it's like the bars here, there are five bars, this one is greater than that one, this one is greater than that one. So I can say the Hill is towards the left, so I can say this is what slightly skewed. But if I want to get the exact value for the skewness, I have to compute it. To be able to find the exact skewness, we need to go through what we illustrated in the previous slide. Okay. So we compute the mean because you need the mean and you can go through it as we have done. Okay, and then you need M2. So M2 is what the average of what the square deviations and you do that. And M3 is also the um, average of this, right? And then we find out the key root of that. Okay, so um, the skewness is then computed as this. We get negative 0.1082. We can adjust it and get a sample coefficient, which is also negative 0.1. So you see, if you look at our rule of thumb, this is what? 
um, close to symmetry, symmetry, close to symmetry distribution. And that's why if you look at the histogram, it doesn't deviate so much from what symmetric distribution. Okay. Now, lastly, we talk about measures of ketosis. So the ketosis is about the tails of the distribution. Okay. Now, so you compare the tails of the distribution to it or to that of what the normal distribution. Now, this can be used as an outlier detection method because if we have an outlier, it's going to stretch out the tail. And that tail will be significantly different from what the normal distribution. So if we have high ketosis in a data set, it means that the data has what, heavy tails or outliers. And such a data set may call for what, some investigation to, to check whether something is wrong. So low ketosis in a data set indicates that the data has a light tails or lack of outliers. Okay. Now, look at this. So this is leptokertic. If you look at this, most of the data set, the leptokerti, most of the data set are centered around the same, you know, location. If you look at this, the variance, okay, the spread is quite large than the leptokerti. The platyketi means it is even spread more and so forth. For ketosis, we have what we term a mesokertic distribution or ketosis. And these are distributions that are similar to that of the normal distribution. You see, if it is normally distributed symmetric, then it means, you know, it doesn't have, let's say, um, outliers, okay? And such a distribution will have a ketosis of three. Now, for, for leptokertic ketosis, these are distributions that have ketosis greater than three. So the IXS ketosis will be positive, right? Remember that when we were finding um, the ketosis, um, the, this one has three, so we'll find what we call the nexus ketosis, which is the difference between the ketosis and that of three, which is the ketosis of the normal distribution. So these leptoketosis, they, they, they are distributions that have longer tails, okay? So they are flatter, and their peaks are um, is higher in sharper than what you have for, let's say, a normal distribution, okay? Now, their tails, in their tails are heavy or um, longer tails, it, it means that there exist some outliers within such a distribution. Now, outliers, because they will be at the extreme either right side of the S axis or the left side of the S axis, it makes the, the, the peak to be what? Narrow, right? High. And that's what we mean by leptokertic, uh, leptokertic distributions. Okay. Now, so the, for plactokertic distributions, these are distributions that have negative excess ketosis. In other words, their ketosis are smaller than what you have for a normal distribution. So such a distribution is short, it's not so high, and the tails are thinner than the normal distribution. Also, the peak is lower okay, than what you have for a normal distribution or mesokertic distribution, okay? But the, the, the 
it, it doesn't mean that they are liars, okay? So they stretch, but they, they don't have our liars because the, the frequencies of these observations are almost the same. Like, it doesn't occur rarely, so, or it's not so distinct from the others. Now, so from this, so you, the three types, you have the mesokeratic, you have the leptokeratic, and then the platykeratic. And you should know the difference between them based on a, a computed ketosis value. Okay. So now we look at how we can compute ketosis. So a ketosis is defined as this. So we find the ketosis using this formula, where M4 is what? The fourth moment and this is still the second moment which is the the variance okay and excess ketosis is just the ketosis minus three this is what i was talking about so our excess ketosis can be negative or positive depending on whether um, the ketosis is greater than three or not okay and the sample ketosis is given by that okay i must say that there are also other forms of ketosis right other ways of computing the ketosis or other estimators of um, the ketosis but we deal with this so this brings us to the end of our lecture so if you have any questions please note them down and ask your respective group lecturers okay and we will give you a set of exercises that will entail all the aspects of these um, um, uh, topics uh, or subtopics we have treated under descriptive statistics for univariate data. So until then, goodbye and take good care of yourself, protect yourself and, and adhere to the, the COVID um, um, protocols so that we can have our classes um, in due course. Thank you. Bye-bye.